I'm Jimmy Palmiotti, and you're watching Invest Comics TV. In part one of this exclusive series with Mr. Neil Adams, Neil related to us how he got started in the business. In the very early days, how he got started with Archie Comics and then moved on to doing daily comics with Ben Casey series. Some of the characters, both real and imagined, and the soap operas surrounding both. But in part two, he told us how he got started with Green Lantern and how that grew into discussing social issues including drug addiction and how that led to a major change in the comics code and the pivotal role that Neil played in that. In part three Neil tells us where the comics industry is likely to go from here and what role Neil and Continuity Studios hopes to play in that entire change and boy is it a big change. Part of what you're doing nowadays is motion graphics. Can we get into that? Motion thing? comics, yeah. Sure. Uh, well, it's we've done a, because I have a because I have an advertising studio. We do we supply advertising work for for advertising agencies. One of the things that we do are things called animatics. Animatics are um, commercials that are drawn and have a soundtrack and are and have some animation and they're basically uh, commercials that never get to the air they're test commercials and we've been doing them for i guess for as long as i've been drawing uh, anything so basically uh, for advertising agencies uh -huh. basically they're animated storyboards is it basically they're animated storyboards on on a very high level sure now, for the last 10 years, I've been trying to convince DC and Marvel to do motion comics, to do a thing called motion comics, that is to animate comic books with this technique and to present it as, whether it's TV shows or videos or however the presentation is, that it's a good way to present a comic book. And, of course, they've said, oh, that's interesting. What is that? We yeah. tried to explain it, and, of course, it fell on deaf ears for 10 years. Finally, over at DC Comics, um, who's the guy that, that uh, did the Watchmen movie? Um, you mean the producer? This is the, the area you cut out when you edit this. No, the director. Um, name escapes me. Okay, name escapes both of us. Anyway, the director of the Watchmen movie who had a lot of wheels at that time before the movie was made, not after the movie was made, but before the movie was, way, was made, a lot of wheels. He said, why don't you take the graphic novel and turn it into an animatic or a motion comic? And they said, huh? He said, no, you can, like, we do this for movies all the time. We do this kind of fake animation and we, and we do it to do scenes and stuff. Why don't you do that with the graphic novel? Well, because he had wheels, they said, sure, we'll do that. And so they did. So the Watchmen became a motion comic. It's crappy. And, it, well, no offense, but, you know, it's, it's got one guy narrating the whole thing, women's voices and everything else. Not yeah. a good idea. Then it has balloons floating in the panels. Not a good idea. Then it has very limited anime. Not a good idea. So there's a lot of not a good ideas in there. But they did it. Okay. Then over at Marvel, at the same time, almost the same instant, Stephen King wanted to experiment with kind of doing a motion comic or doing an animatic of one of his short stories. And so he and his producers and CBS and Random House, I believe it was Random House, Please his go. publisher, um, uh, hired Marvel Comics to do a work made for hire for them because Marvel was doing a lot of stuff in, on, on the Internet that showed kind of animated comic book panels and stuff. And so they hired Marvel. They didn't come to us, which was would have been the perfect thing to do. They hired Marvel, 
And they, uh, Marvel had Alex Maleev illustrated. Alex Maleev was a very good artist, excellent artist. And, and then they used their people on staff to create little animations, semi-animations. And they presented that as, uh, um, well, again, it, not very good. Not very good because technique-wise, although the art was fantastic and the soundtrack was fantastic, there was no animation, literally no animation. So and so when we went to, now that this was going on, we went to Marvel and DC and said, look, we've been doing this for years, for, for decades. Yep. We know how to do this better than anybody. You should have us do it. Well, uh, then we showed samples and kind of messed up people's heads. And then we showed how uh, Stephen King's thing could have, be, could have been done better with moving mouths and gestures and stuff. And finally, Marvel said, hey, you know, that, this is pretty good. They had us do a sample with uh, Frank Miller stuff. And that turned out so good that they gave us the uh, X-Men uh, gifted graphic novel for us to animate, turn into a motion comic. And we did. I would say it is the best motion comic to date, okay? It is still not as good as we sh should have done, would have done, if the budget were a little bit better. I think if, if it were a little bit better and we did the things that we might have done and we can do now technologically, it would be as good as any animated film. Probably better because we're using the artist's work and the writer's words. Sure. So everything in this gifted motion comic is the artist's work and the writer's words. It's not an adaptation. It's the graphic novel made to move. So there's lots of stuff in it that, as the comic book fan, I would, and I'm sure you would, appreciate because I'm looking at one of my favorite artists' work and I'm looking at one of my favorite writer's words, or listening to my, one of my favorite writer's words, rather than Bruce, Tim, and, and uh, Warner Animation doing this kind of a adaptation that, although nice, yeah. has nothing to do with the actual product as it was presented. To be honest, I'm lucky to have lived through that day. I almost didn't. That train was barreling down the Colson freight yards and it wasn't slowing down for me. I had climbed up on the freight car and suddenly I realized it wasn't a freight car at all. It's just a job after all. How hard is it to press reset before you turn me off? Looks like a United Animal Space bring it to me. Hello, my darling. Your last blossom beckons. Hey, <laughs> You never loved me. Oh. Get down, spicy food. Have oh, I've got such a headache. I only want you. This pile of junk is that. The lead in goes in together. Yes? That ain't half the problem. Part of this unit don't even coexist in the same time continuum with us. It's not easy being green. I tried it once.
Here's a riddle for you. What do the California Gold Rush of the 1850s, secret societies, coded messages, mysterious 19th century flying machines, and an early 20th century outside artist named Charles A. A. Delshaw all have in common? The Secrets of Delshaw by Dennis Crenshaw and Pete Navarro. Go to www.secretsofdelshaw.com to learn more. Yeah, the problem with all of this is that that amount of work has to be monetized. Somebody has to make money on it for it to be worthwhile. So far, it's very difficult to do that. Marvel Comics has produced a videotape. First of all, they did they they they, they did it on the internet and did it a couple of places on the internet and had moderate success. Then they did uh, a reissue. Uh, of the graphic novel with the uh, tape inside, the, the disc inside, the CD inside, which they made more money on. Then they did a licensed out uh, uh, DVD. The DVD turned out to be pretty good. Uh, I don't know how many they sold or, how, or whether the royalty from that is worth it, but had it been done directly by by Marvel Comics, sure. maybe Marvel Comics in association, in association with Disney, which they happen to be associated with very heavily now, yep. I think that they would have made a very good profit, especially the way Disney markets DVDs. Anyway, uh, and CDs. Anyway, they they weren't able to go that route, and so they're, the question is, is it worth doing it? So now they're doing motion comics as promotion for films and other stuff. They haven't taken that next step, nor has DC taken that next step. I know what the next step is, perfectly logical, and there's a way to monetize it. You just have to be smart about it. And if that can be done, we're going to see, and I believe we will see sooner or later, it's just a matter of time, we will see motion comics of our favorite comic books. Sure. All systems are functional. I'm going to pass the reins to Mr. Jackal, the chief, the new king of radio. Is there life on other planets? This is nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman, and now I'm a voice in the Jackal's head. Is the government keeping secrets from us? This is Stephen Bassett, and uh, I am now a voice inside the Jackal's head. Want to find out more? Listen to the Jackal's head on the soup. Media Network. The biggest trick the Jack ever pulled was to convince the world that he doesn't exist. I have to admit, I had not seen the Stephen King story in, adapted as a graphic novel in motion, until after Neil had mentioned it. So I went and looked at it. I'm going to show you a clip. You'll see what he meant about no animation, not a good idea. I didn't really have a vision of what N would be um, as a graphic, downloadable version of my story. And uh, N is kind of, I'd have to say, the birth of a nation of this particular medium. It does something that is a hybrid. Well, as we can see, Stephen King doesn't really get it either. And as far as that being a hybrid, hybrids don't reproduce. Let's look for something that can uh, be a little more prolific and I think that Neil has a little better handle on it than Stephen King, Marvel, DC and the rest of the d industry combined so that pretty much wraps up part 3 of this series but in part 4 and the final I'm sorry to say Neil gives us a couple more insights into the future of comics in general motion comics in particular and also into his current project so stick with us